welcome to Art, Science, Nature, Knit. I'm Natalie, Cool Water, Hot Sun. And welcome! Thanks for joining in. Um, it is Monday and it is freezing here. I have my ugly Christmas sweater on over my down jacket with all the warmies. So I decided to come climb up to a rock wall, a beautiful, beautiful sandstone, pebbly conglomerate, say that 10 times fast, pebbly conglomerate, um, where there would be the south facing radiating warmth, which is what the Anasazi took advantage of around here, almost exclusively. And I don't want to say exclusively because there's always exceptions, but the Anasazi um, built their cave dwellings in uh, almost always south-facing um, caves. So anyway, I'm acting like an Anasazi today, and so are you. Thanks for trekking up here with me. Um, yeah, it was three degrees last night. All the rivers were frozen. Um, this morning when I drove into town and um, yeah so we're kicking it up here lots of knitting today and at the very end we have a finished object field trip um, but just a, first a few quick hellos um, thanks to everybody who uh, responded to the last episode and the wrap it was really fun to make and there are 65 podcasters um, who I shouted out to name dropped in that thing. Um, and thanks to new podcasters who I hadn't heard of. I said, tell me who you are. Tell me who you are. Some did, so I will check those out. Thanks for letting me know about them. And thanks to everybody for watching. And um, that was my tribute wrap. And lo and behold, if last week I didn't get wrapped... Thank you, Denise of the Knitting Den. So sweet of you. And honestly, it was really, actually, I think it's always unexpected. I think that's why it's supposed to be random. And it is really fun. I highly recommend you go out and wrap someone. Random act of pattern, which was Carrie, Knit Pearl Girl's idea. And her memory will live on very fondly with that. It's so much fun. So I got, um... Denise gifted me a pattern by Carrie Steinmetz called The Lady Edith. And it is such a beautiful shawl. And by buying Carrie Steinmetz patterns right now is not only a great idea because you all of the money will be going to support her family, but um, they are wonderful patterns. They're very well written and they're gorgeous. I personally love the sort of leaf motifs and the nature designs. And so thanks again, Denise. I'll be knitting that up for sure. And um, I think it's really fun. Um, another of Carrie's ideas. <laughs> the crazy ugly sweater. I mean, is this fun or what? But um, the gals from Multicraftal always also thought of this um, and threw it out there. I think maybe before they realized that Carrie had thrown it out there, which is great because you know what we call that in the science world? We call that convergent evolution. When a great idea emerges, usually in body form or coloring or some kind of special adaptation, um, independently in two separate populations of two separate kinds of not uh, animals that don't breed or plants um because it's such a great idea more than one person or thing is going to think of it so we get in multi-craftual y'all that's going off to libby and um jesse of multi-craftual because they're having a random mail-in stuff mail them something and they'll mail you something back i love all the mailings that people are throwing around so um thanks for all the fun stuff podcasters um and 
And one more fun thing on the podcaster note, um, Paula of the Knitting Pipeline um, put forth um, <laughs> these, she put forth an idea that I, that also Joanna of Knit Spin Farm picked up on that I somehow missed and I completely, wholeheartedly endorse the use of the phrase kindness of knitters when there's a group of um, more than a few knitters, like a covey of quail or a murder of crows. Uh, I thought that was a really, really fun idea. So <laughs> get with your kindness. I did this weekend with my group. And um, the one, so thanks you guys. I think that's a great idea. I'm all for it. And um, Paula of the Knitting Pipeline also last time showed these very freaky old like 19 I want to say 40s 50s patterns of full ski masks they're just scary they're scary they're crazy clowns they're crazy hair crazy skeleton whatever they're nuts but um and most of the people who commented on that said they would never knit that that's the freakiest thing but I guess it was in vogue back then uh but along that same lines I discovered a really amazing um, fiber artist who, this is from maybe 2010 or 2011, I think his opening show debut was in 2011. So you, some of you might have already heard of this, but I wanted to re-put it out there because it's so dang cool. Um, a fiber artist by the name of Ben Cuevas also knits these kind of anatomical face masks, but they're more about the muscles and the jaw, and he also has a an entirely fully knitted skeleton. And so I will show you a picture here. And um, I'll link to a couple sites that have some of the best pictures of it. Um, just in case you want to check out something really anatomical and knitted. Um, if you haven't seen that already, I thought it was amazing. Absolutely amazing. The detail, every tooth, every, you'll, yeah. Amazing. So, that is it for intros. Let's knit what is, like I said, there's a finished object field trip. Well, every ob finished object is a field trip in my show. I always take everything out. Um, I have a couple other finished objects, but I'm going to jam right into what's in the, um, my crazy, my crazy K-A-L. I had a thought that my crazy should be repairing things. I never want to repair mitts or gloves or, I'm wearing two different gloves right now because, from two separate pairs, because I don't want to repair anything. Um, <laughs> I also never weave in ends. See? There's an end. Not, I, I don't know. I do. I do, eventually. But um, the first thing on the list of my crazy KAL is a grand conclusion. Um, no longer in the study phase. Completed. And this is, again, it's not really a knit-along. But I wanted to show you guys because it came out so wonderful. It is the... Snowflake for Carrie Steinmetz family, and you probably guys probably already know it. today is the day to mail them in. Um, the address is available through um, the Knit Pearl Friends of Knit Pearl Girl Ravelry Group. Um, and I'm sure even if you made one still, it would get to the family if you mailed one in. But it's to replace all their Christmas tree ornaments that got lost. So I knitted the Aeolus, which is a 14,000 foot peak near me. And um, I followed Coggy TM's advice and used a, a half water, half sugar syrup to then block it with. And it really works. It's not too stiff, but it does hold its shape. So... Really happy to be showering them with a blizzard of love and light and hope. 
and um, not only that, but it got me to crochet, which I never thought I'd do. <laughs> and it was kind of difficult, but you know, with YouTube and so many online resources, it was really fun. And now I know what I can make flowers, and I'm really happy that it pushed me out of my comfort zone to learn something new that I never thought I. I it's really fun to go back to beginner brain. Um, and it had some of the same, uh, you could say like mesmerizing effect that knitting does, but it wasn't, I wasn't comfortable with it. Um, strangely enough, I was using my left hand to hold the yarn, which I never do in knitting, but pretty cool. So that's going off in the mail soon as we're done here. I really like it. I'm really tempted to make more. I'm really inspired and it's just great to, when something pushes you and you get so much out of it. So, And I'm really happy that her family will hopefully really enjoy these. Um, what else? So, the next thing that is in the study phase for my, I'm doing like six knit-alongs and um, trying to get them all done before the end of December. That's my crazy, and it is driving me crazy. I will be happy to just knit whatever I want. Not that I mind, I'm picking things I want to do, but um, this is... See that? Have a look. The Four Good Hat by Megan Williams of the Stockinette Zombies. Oh, I'm right in the middle of it. Um, there's this wonderful little. There's the ribbing. Gosh, can you see that? There's the ribbing, but then there's also, the ribbing stops here, but the there's this little button band that continues where the button goes, and that's really fun. And then there's this wonderful, I'm calling it a staggered waffle pattern because it makes this little like it's like a waffle pattern it's like a checkerboard but the checkerboards are chevron shaped so that's really cool and I love in the pattern the pattern's really easy um, well it's not super easy it's easy but it requires attention to keep track of it I could memorize it I never really had to print it out but um, <laughs> You could get lost. You can get you can lose your place pretty easily, or or forget where you are. But it it actually is easy to keep track of, and I really like it. Um, there is this part where you cast off and re pick up stitches. I hate casting off. I hate picking up stitches, <laughs> but it's worth it because it's making those really beautiful little um, kind of trim line around the, it's going to go around the brim of the hat. And I am talking it up because it's a really great pattern. It was really cheap and it is a, a fundraiser pattern. Every penny, the cost of the pattern, except for, I guess, PayPal and Ravelry fees, for, it's only cost four forty three. And every penny goes to the National Women's Health Network in memory of Megan's sister, Melly, who passed away in 2007. Um, and the Women's Health Network is an organization that strives to provide the latest research and up-to-date information on drugs and devices and um, procedures that are available to women um, and make sure that they're 
women can get information that they need about whatever they need. And I wholeheartedly support this. This is, I want to buy five patterns for people for this or more, um, or even just donate to them. I'm really grateful for Megan for bringing this to my attention because, um, you know, it's been a long road for women, um, to have access to adequate health care and birth control and to be able to control their bodies and to get good, reliable information. And uh, it's something that hits home to me and to a lot of other people, I'm sure. So I'm happy to support them and I'm happy to push supporting the National Women's Health Network. And they don't get any of their money from tobacco companies, pharmaceutical companies, or any device manufacturers. So. Um, they're counting on us to give them money. I'm happy to give them money. And um, I'm really grateful to be in a time where information is accessible. And it is actually even a scary time to think that, you know, people are actually trying to roll back some of the, um, you know, available resources to women and it's just startling so I'm keeping that going um the, yeah the hat is great and it's a great hat it's a great hat I'm knitting it um uh, with blue sky alpacas Surrey alpaca it's 60% Surrey alpaca 40% merino in the earth colorway and heck yeah I did not mind so much picking up those stitches on my new set of Haya Haya! 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 Haya Haya interchangeable needle set. The Haya Haya sharps, steel sharps. Adore them. I love them. I got the small set, which comes in sizes two through eight. I'm using the sixes on the hat which seem to be in demand. I think I'm going to have to get more sixes. But yeah, they're sh very sharp pointed. And they are race car needles. Zoom, zoom. I didn't mind picking up stitches so much with these sharp little babies. And they are, they are slick. That, they almost um, I think some people wouldn't like them because they might think that they were too slick. They slide out of the stitches, but I don't mind. I like that. I like things moving right along. And when I first, the the blue, it has this blue cable. I'm magic looping this. Um, and when I was sort of road testing these from bits and pieces I could get in stores, the cable was white and it was really kinky. And these aren't. These flop around just just right. And when I, the join is gorgeous. When I first got it, the join has a little, there's no way you'll be able to see this, but the join has a little, um, I can feel a little bit of a roughness there, but only, it's very, it's at the, only at the scale of my hands. The, there's no catching of the, of the wool. And this, this would be, you would know it if it was happening with this one. This is a single ply and it's very fuzzy, so. Love them. I do. I feel like I am a race car driver when I use these. So, love them. Definitely going to get more cables and probably another six. And they make a two and a half. And these are the longer ones. The, the longer length of... These are the fives. They make a four. They sent me a 16-inch cable, but it, I don't think they really work with these. I do have a, a size 2 in the 4-inch ones that I could use for socks or something. That uh, Magic looping's just fine with me. Woohoo! But don't worry, double-pointed needles. I won't stop using you. I promise. So, yeah, for good hat. Feels good. It does. Feels really good. Um, and then... The next knit along thing in the study phase is the What Just Watching podcast. Emily is hosting, Ooh Fancy Pants is hosting with Hollywood Knitter um, podcast. 
the wonderful and crazy beatnik. The beatnik sweater with all those wonderful and crazy cables. By Nora Gone. And it's luscious. It's done in a, I don't know, not wool, uh, tweed sort of blend, but I'm not doing that. But there's another crazy thing that happened to me is I actually got gauge on this with the yarn that I am using. And the yarn that I am using is camel. It's a camel yarn by Today is all about the nonprofits. It's camel from Mongolia, hand spun in Mongolia by Mongolian people. And this is something that is in, done for the Snow Leopard Trust. And what they try to do is get Mongolian folks to, I guess, you know, snow leopard pelts were worth a lot of money and they were threatening this probably already stressed species um, by hunting them. So this organization has um, tried to make a market for their woolen products. And actually, if you go to their website, I'll link to it, they have the cutest little ornaments and booties and toys and just great little um, Christmas presents. This is your purchase supports snow leopard conservation and improves the livelihood of impoverished nomadic herding women and families. www.snowleopard.org and they really do have a lot of great little things that people have made. And they have all this wonderful wool, which is dyed, hand dyed, hand spun, and it's great. I love it. It's really rustic though. I don't know that everyone would love it. It has, um, it's thick and thin. It has several, you know, um, it's, there's a thin, thin section. It's, it's pretty inconsistent, but it's not too bad. It has, um, the, the dye is coming off in my hand, so I think it's going to bleed a lot, and that's okay. That's fine with me. It has all these little flecks of straw and maybe plastic or something in it, but um, <laughs> I love it. This is going to be my this is going to be my go out in the woods and don't worry about it. Beat it beat it up sweater, but check it out. Here's the problem. I got. Do you see the striping? Can you tell that it has, I'm alternating four skeins. And I got two years, years and years ago at a, uh, see it, the Northwest Free Folk Life Festival in Seattle. I got this, which I adore. I absolutely adore this, this bright navy blue. And they were really nice. I had only two yards. It says, it's funny because it says, oh, approximately 150 to 200 yards, maybe five or six ounces. So you don't exactly know what you've got. And I realized, I started making a different sweater with this. And I realized, oh, I don't have enough yarn. So I ordered more yarn from them and more yarn came and it was really different than this. And I sent them a, a sn sample of this and said, can you match this as good as possible? And they really, I thought it was really sweet of them. I actually sent them return chipping and everything, but um, they sent me this which is similar, but definitely not exact. It's a little darker, and it's a little more variegated. And so, I don't know what I'm going to do. I really don't want a striped sweater. But if this is just going to be kind of my play sweater, then maybe I don't care. I don't know. Can you see... The stripes. So I've gotten the ribbing done and I was shocked. I got gauge on size eights. The ribbing's done on sixes and the cabling has begun on the eights. But you can't probably see very much of that. Okay. 
Yeah, you can definitely see the striping in there. Um, anyways, I had a couple thoughts. <laughs> the, there's, for me, for my size, making the medium, there's 12 stitches on either side, and then there's two, three, basic three panels of cabling, and I thought maybe if I did, if I ripped it all out and did the sides in the darker blue, which I don't like as much, and then just all the cabling in the royal blue, which I really like, would that work? Or something like that? Um, not sure. I don't even know if I have enough. I have some natural color of not undyed. It's like a really nice tan that I might also intersperse. Or maybe I'll just put up with the striping. I don't know. What do you think? I might even need to end up making the sleeves out of the, the natural. Huh. It's going to be a lot of work. I'm going to measure my yarn and actually look and see how much yarn the pattern calls for. I'm going to do all my homework and then decide whether I want to rip back or not because I'm not that far along. It's just the second sweater I've started with this, so... Oh no! And of course, I got my charts on my tray. <laughs> With my magnets. It's working great. I love that. Love that system. What else? So, um, yeah, check out the the KAL. It goes through January 10th and the Witcher Swatchin' or the Hollywood Knitter um, threads on the raft groups. There's prizes. I don't know if you have to actually finish to qualify for a prize. I don't think I'm going to finish by January 10th. Like I said, I'm not that dedicated to finishing KALs on time. Um, but I'm I'm getting some of them. Definitely. So the next thing in the study phase. I don't know if you guys watched last time I showed swatch color swatches of a jacket that I'm working on and I did go get some more yarn but I haven't made the swatch yet so I'll show that next time. Um, but I think I got something I'm really happy with. I got like a teal. Anybody who cares who remembers from last time. So, finished object field trip. The grand conclusion of the potholder experiment. Results are in. Potholders are awesome. This is really great. It is so thick. It's very thick. Is it as thick as a finger? It is about as thick as a finger. Maybe a little thinner. Love it! Nobody's getting burnt in my house. So this is... I wanted to see how much it shrank. This is Cascade Magnum in the... several different scraps and colorways. Let me see. I think I have a scrap of it. Or not. Or not. Oh yeah, I wanted to say the reason why, oh, back to the beatnik really quick, I started doing them on straights, <laughs> and then I switched to the high highs and everything was great. Um, things get really heavy on straights, but I remember Dawn of Knit and Wolf, now I understand maybe why um, Dawn of Knit and Wolf was saying that she learned how to knit with one needle tucked into her armpit. Um, I can see why, because if you were knitting a sweater on straights, I mean, it got so hard to move these, even when I only had about two inches of ribbing done, just because there's so much weight on these, and if you're working on the tips, you have all this weight on the other end, and race car needles, hi hi us, yay. Anyway, um, I don't have, I grabbed some chunky to show you guys, but I didn't make it in, let me see. Make sure. Nope. Dang it. Well, chunky, big, thick, thick as a finger on size 13 needles. And so, actually, that was kind of the right size needles for that yarn, so there wasn't a whole lot of space. Um, and I didn't get as much shrink as I thought. And I thought I would get more, you can see that it's still oblong. I thought it was going to shrink more in this axis than in this axis. It went from 
16 by 12 to now it's 11 by 8. And so that's in both directions about equal amount of shrinkage, about 70% in both directions, um, which is not what I expected. I thought it was going to shrink more in the long axis. Um, no, so it shrank 0.69, almost 7% in this direction and 0.67 in that direction. So that's about the same in both directions, but it don't matter. I might be making some of these for Christmas gifts. They're so fun. But I think I'd use smaller yarn and thick is good though for pot holders. And we use these for our wood stove and to put on the table. So fun. And in that same vein. Do 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 these slippers ain't made for walking. I don't know why I made these four times. Um, again, the Cascade Magnum in turquoise. It's the drops. Free Pattern on Ravelry drops 104-4, um, and I showed it last time how it's folded up and then felted, and the shape came out way... Hey, there it is! Here's the chunky yarn. That's pretty thick. It's chunky. The felting, the shape came out way better than I expected. It had been weird on the on one of them, and they look a little tall, but I shrank them too much, and now they don't fit. I think if I wear them around a little bit, I've, I've re... I stretched them once after I felted them, re-wetted them after I realized they were too small, stretched them a little bit more. They stretched more. They might... I might work into them. If not, snip, 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 snip. I'm going to turn them into pot holders. You know, Fiber Trends has a much better felted slipper clog pattern that I think I might try again on. And um, I'm really glad I'm going to wear these and see if they work. Otherwise, they're getting snipped. But I, I'm glad I reinforced the foot. I even doubled up the yarn um, because I had another pair of these that are a year old and they're already wearing through the toe, and they've been worn daily in the winter. So, um, and I shaved one. One is shaved. After it comes out, they're really fuzzy. And the other one, not shaved yet. But they're really warm. I think I'm going to like them if they break in. So, I really kind of just like them, just because they're cool. They're They're a fun pattern. They're fun. I mean, how many green and blue zebras have you seen in the world? Not many. Now, my feet are blue and green zebras. Um, am I able to go get a shoe stretcher from a from a shoe store? I used to have one. I wish I had it still. So. Yeah, except for the finished object field trip, which you'll see at the end. That's it for what I got going on. What's in the study phase? Um, what's coming up in theory is... Um, I still... One more KL that I need to do is I want to make an Afghan square for the Hurricane Sandy relief effort. And there is a RAV group dedicated to that that I will link to. And... Um, yeah, they have all kinds of stats to follow, 10 by 10, or whatever. Don't don't listen to me. Go check out the page. Um, and I think that's till the end of December. But, of course, I think, again, you know, with charity, if you're going to do it after the deadline, that's okay, too, probably. Um, so, I want to do 
more Christmas presents. I'm still, I'm totally lagging. My family knows that sometimes I don't make Christmas on time. <laughs> so, but I want to make some little baby sweaters, which Joanna of Knit Spin Farm also has um, a whole thread for tiny knits, which I think is just hilarious. This is a, these are designs by Barocco, who um, is recommending using um, Ultra Alpaca or Ultra Alpaca Light, which I happen to have a bunch of. It's really thin. Like, you could probably use any fine fingering, but this is a free pattern on Barocco's webpage. Um, and I'll link to it. Yeah, it's called Minutia. They're cute. You know, I gotta think of something to make for my warm dwelling family members who I want to knit for, but they won't wear socks or hats or anything. So, that is up and coming, I hope. And, of course, the Lady Edith, and, which is Carrie's, one of Carrie's patterns. And also, I got crosswords at the coffee shop to knit along in her In Memory of Carrie group. And this is just beautiful. And it calls for an Aaron Waite. And I am so grateful to Unwind Yarn Company who maybe she still has some more but she has died specially for people who want to get some yarn to do that for the knit along. Um, a really beautiful variegated blues, whites and blacks of Voyage Erin. I don't have it yet. It's shipped but it's on its way and um, might want to check that out and see if she's got any left. Um, if you want a, a blue theme for that, Erin Wait. Um, but people are already off and running and knitting. The group is huge so I'm really happy to join in and maybe knit those two shawls. Rango Knitting Group. We're making tree scarves to do a yarn bomb. We're going to knit for trees. Yay! Because who doesn't love trees? And with that, speaking of trees, I think that's it for the knit. And um, if you're interested, Stay with us for a little bit of nature, and we're gonna jam right into the nature right now. And I'll start right here. So, if you don't want to hear the nature, skip to the end, and you can see the finished object field trip because there's one more really, really awesome piece of knitting at the end, which is my last knit along. It's gloves for Let's Hear It for the Guys for the Poly Knit podcast. Let's hear it for the guys knit along. Any men's knit. Um, join in till Christmas, I guess. So um, that field trip is way up at 12,000 feet. And today's nature lesson is uh, about how tree species um, associations, they call them tree uh, plant associations there's like groups of certain species of plants that gather together um those clicks i get tree clicks i guess you could call them tree gangs uh they <laughs> change as you come up and as you go vary in elevation and so um we're kind of at a lower we're sort of at a mid one right now um low, low uh, lower than middle um i'm hoping to have a visual aid for you here but in the very very lowest down in the desert you have your sagebrush country and um that's probably about three four five thousand feet and then as you rise up into the more like five six thousand foot level you get into the pinyon juniper forests and then um down in the valleys, like you saw, if you watched episode five, you saw a lot of the cottonwoods and the willows down in the um, really wet river bottom zones. And those could be at any elevation as long as it's wet. 
And then um, as you climb some of the slopes in the 6,000, 8,000 foot range, um, you're kind of either in pinyon juniper, so, or maybe more shrub scrub. And those could change, those kind of intermingle depending on, so within that elevation, you could be on a south-facing slope, like we're on now, that's a little more warm, a little more dry, um, and have more scrub and oak. So you have things like um, gamble oak and mountain mahogany and cliff rose and very shrubby, shrubby um, species. Or you could be maybe on a north-facing slope that has um, more water and is colder, and that could be more pinyon juniper. Um, and then you start climbing above that, and you get up to, you know, your six, seven, eight, nine thousand. You grade into just ponderosa pine. And right now we're sitting, we're at about seven thousand feet, and we're at a really great transition between. Um, the pinyon juniper and the ponderosa pine. And so what we've got here is uh, as I was hiking down below there were some pinyon pines, just a few. But even as I just hiked up maybe 50 or 100 feet, no more pinyon pines, only junipers and ponderosas and the gamble oaks because we're in the south face so we're going to have more scrub but we've got the gamble oaks but not um, the shrubs. And right here we've got the beautiful ponderosa pine which is, I just have a couple specimens. It's a lovely pine Pines always have these sheaths at the base of their needle bundles. The needles are bundled and they're tied together by that sheath. And this is very long, very long, like six inch long needles. And they're in groups of, pines are recognized by their, how many needles they have. And this seems to have three. Every sheath is bundled into groups of three. And sometimes that can vary. It can throw you off. Maybe, I thought this was a four. Yeah, this, wait, this one. Nope, all threes. You have to, sometimes you just pick the one that has four and you go to your ID book and you're like, huh? So here's the cone. And this is an old cone. And I've learned the difference. Ponderosas are very, very widespread. They're one of the most widespread conifers in the West. You look at a map and they're everywhere. Like you get sick, if you could get sick of a conifer, which I could never get sick of, but you can almost get sick of ponderosas because they're everywhere. But um, in California, they hybridize with Jeffrey's pines and they smell so good. They smell like butterscotch, Jeffrey's pines, and ponderosas. But ponderosas, if you roll them like this, prickly, Jeffrey's are gentle. They don't have the spines on the ponderosa stick out. So, and around here, they, you could see that some of them, here's a more young cone that's more brown, but it's being eaten by the chipmunks and the squirrels. <laughs> you see a lot of these around here right now. They're getting in there and they're going for the seeds. And this is a beautiful example of a winged seed. Oh, no! <laughs> it's spiraling out. You guys have seen maples. Beautiful winged seed. Ah, I broke it. Anyways, they're getting in there and they are munching on those. And then around here we also have the junipers. Just a few. And they're these very feathery, wispy, very cool trees with put on the juniper berries which people have made gin out of, and I think they probably still do. I had an IPA at Mammoth Brewing Company a couple years ago that was um, juniper berries and sagebrush. And then we also have right around here the beautiful, beautiful, beautiful gamble oak. 
which if you watched episode two, the fall color showcase, mmm, fall colors. And then we're going to go up and we're going to have a peek at, um, so then from here, you if you go up higher, you get into the, like a nine, ten thousand foot zone, you get into, um, you start getting it interspersing ponderosa pines with uh, firs and aspens. And then 10,000, 11,000 feet. I might be getting my elevations wrong, but um, I'll correct myself if I am. But then you start getting into fir and spruce. And here is an Engelmann spruce. And um, here is the cones. And again, ID is really tricky. I, it took me out in the field. Here's the cone. And it is um, really similar to a Colorado blue spruce. So it wasn't until, and then you'll see up in the, up in the higher elevations where I thought it was supposed to be spruce and fir, I was calling pines firs, uh, and even when I got up close to it, I thought it was a limber pine. Um, but just goes to show you how great being wrong can be. Learned so much being wrong. Here I thought I was looking at limber pines, and they turned out to be lodgepole pines, which I think is actually kind of a. Um, they're also a very widespread tree, but around here, um, I think that's just. I still haven't confirmed this, but there's a little pocket of of, um, of the lodgepole pines. So join us as we go through all of those um, elevations and tree associations, and uh, we'll end up at the finished object field trip. And so hope you enjoy. Hope you and your crafts are getting out in the field. See you next time. Bye. So here we are, up in the high country at about 11,000 feet. And my original voice recording was way too windy. But you can see we're at the upper elevations, and you can see tree line where it turns to dirt and down here we're in what's normally called the spruce fir belt except what we have are spruces which are the bright green and the or the blue green and then we have lodgepole pines which are the yellow green trees and instead of firs we have the lodgepole pines for some reason i think this is kind of unique to the san juans um, and you can see as you go up higher, it turns into only the dark green trees, which are the Engelmann spruce. And the, as you go down lower in elevation, it's the mix between the two. And you have right here in front of us, a beautiful Engelmann spruce. And it is very blue. The blue spruce cones are more shaggy and the Engelmann spruce cones are more rounded and they have the um, orange or flakier bark. And then to the right you have the blue yellow green trees which are the lodgepole pines which were easily mistaken for limber pines which you'll see in just a second. But um, Beautiful, beautiful day. So we know this is a limber pine because well, we'll look for some cones in a minute, but it's a two leaf pine, short leaf, but the way you really know, and it's got the bracts at the base of the leaf, but the way you really know that this is a limber pine is you can tie it in knots. You can tie it in a knot. You can tie it in a bow. Isn't that crazy? It'd be good for wreath making or 
snowshoe straps or something. Let's see, here's some male cones. Those are spent. They put out pollen in the spring. And then, every, people know what pine cones look like, right? Let's see if we can find a pine cone. Um, here's some immature ones, the ones that didn't open. Uh, but yeah, they look like small little pine cones. Here's one over here on a dead branch. I'm going with limber pine. Okay. So maybe we've made 12,000 feet. And we're about to leave some of the last woody vegetation. These, believe it or not, are willows. And they're acting very strangely because they're getting pummeled by wind. Pummeled by wind and snow all the time. They're very branchy. And they must, they must be growing on these slopes because these slopes probably have a, willows usually like a lot of water and these slopes are probably holding a lot of water in the spring when the snow melts. These soils are very loose and probably percolate water really great. So you get a lot of these willows and you're really about to get into alpine. We've totally left any kind of conifers behind. That little dark patch there and the base of the cliffs is another little patch of willows, but that's it. And then we are climbing up into this notch, the yellow, and we're about to get up into the chunky, chunky monkey volcanics. You can see that is quite full of rocks. The volcanics exploded, picked up a bunch of rocks and welded them all together, and they're laying on top of the red, which is sedimentary. So there was a lava flow here at one time. So here we go. So here we are. Today's finished object field trip comes to you from... The slopes of the Grand Turk. The slopes of the Grand Turk. And for that, you need some pretty warm gloves because we're at 12,000 feet and it's cold and windy out here. So for the occasion, we've brought along a freshly finished object these are beautiful Surrey Blue Sky Alpacas, Surrey 60% Surrey Alpaca and 40% Merino Wool. And the brown checks are um, Plymouth Earth, and they are also a, I think they're an alpaca and silk blend. And... That'll be on the show notes. I never remember the percentages, but um, they're a beautiful pair of gloves, and they were custom made, following just some general, not even a general pattern, but um, they are David's gloves, and you can kind of see that the pattern on the right glove is more wide and open compared to the pattern on the left glove. And the right glove is definitely bigger at this point than the left glove. Um, same number of stitches, perfectly replicated the left glove, took lots of notes on the right glove, but tighter gauge, that's because I can never knit the second thing the same size as the first thing. I guess I'm a tighter knitter. So David will demonstrate this right now. Well, basically, hang on, before <laughs> the, I measured all of his body parts and for some reason even though I thought I knew my gauge, which is about six stitches per inch, everything was coming out much smaller. So this is 36 stitches round, which is way too few. And then I started to um, do the gusset increases, and I realized that this cuff was going to be too small for his... Um, 36 stitches around in stockinette is, was too small for his hand. So I used the increases that would normally be the beginning of the thumb gusset to fit his hand. 
and then I started the thumb gusset. So he's going to demonstrate this and put them on. So you can see the right glove, right glove first. It's a lovely fit. Is that hard to get on? No, it's snug, but not difficult. Not difficult. Mm. And how's that fit? This, this one is like just perfect. I mean, it's almost like you measured all my body parts. Well, all my hand parts. I did measure all your hand parts multiple times. I measured, I measured the circumference of his wrist. I measured the circumference of his hand. I measured the length between the base of the fingers to the base of the hand. I measured where this should lie on the back of the hand, you know, within that circumference, you know, how many inches need to go between here and, you know, basically where's the midline so that this could line up. Um, and it didn't matter how much I measured. It seemed like, you know, it's a, like, let's just say his, the circumference around the hand is eight and a half centimeters or eight and a half inches. You do the math, eight and a half inches times six stitches per inch is 55 stitches or whatever. But, but no, I ended up having to <laughs> go up to 66 stitches. And I realized it's probably because of course the cable pattern sucks things in. Um, so much so that it really made the next glove almost too tight. Watch this. You can hardly get into this one, right? This one's a little tight around the cuff. <laughs> There's a really tight spot right Because I the knitted cuff. it. But what do we love? Gloves. We love... <laughs> yeah. And we love blocking. Oh, I didn't know that till now. Hope to God. Okay, we love blocking. <laughs> so, believe it or not... Mm, the sure. rest of the glove feels it's great though it's tighter than the other one but it really still feels good <laughs> i mean like the proverbial glove if it's like the proverbial glove but that see how that pattern on the left's a little tighter and it's not wanting to lay on the perfect back of your hand you know like the the right one it's centered nicely on the back of the hand but this one it's pulling to the outside of your hand mm. but i'm hoping we can block it open a little bit um but yeah believe it or not this is 50 stitches around 55 and so is this one but this one's smaller um actually i counted them last night i can't remember if it's 50 or 55 or what i knew i had to go like 66 stitches around um up to where you'd have separate the thumb off for the gusset but then it goes back down to like 55 stitches but regardless of what the actual stitch count is they're the same so why are these town gloves and not hiking gloves you're asking me yeah because these are too nice to tear up while i'm hiking but why would they get torn up because I know they don't have nylon <laughs> in them, and they're not super wash, so you can't. They're not super wash. Throw them in the wash. Right, I forgot about that part. See all the little ends sticking out? I wove my ends in, but look now they're sticking out. See on the two tips of your right hand? Yeah. Sure do. Yep. <laughs> so the other cool thing, the other trippy thing about these is when I was knitting them, I was I was taking them off the needles and having him try them on, but the as I was going up, the palm was shorter than the back of the hand. So I actually ended up doing four short, I did four short rows back and across the palm to catch up the length of the mm. palm to the back of the hand. So they're kind of perfectly custom gloves. So. Mm, I feel so good. <laughs> and it's cold out here right now. So let's wave to the mountains and show everybody where we are. Up, 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 up. Hi, mountains. <laughs> Thanks, David, for finished object field trip. You're welcome, Natalie. Should I show you? <laughs> Happy glove recipient. <laughs>